it's Brad Laurie of Blockchain Brad, and today a very special interview with Barney Mannerings. He is a co-founder of a very important protocol known as Vega Protocol, all about DeFi derivatives, platform and protocol itself. Barney, thank you very much for being here to educate us all about Vega. Thanks for having me, Brad. You're welcome, mate. Now, I've heard a lot about you. You certainly uh, bring a lot to the space. You have a lot of experience as well. Barney, do you want to just touch on a little bit of your background so that you know, we can get to know you a bit better about where you come from and, and why you entered into this crazy world called blockchain? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm a computer scientist uh, sort of originally by, from university and I spent most of my career kind of designing and building trading platforms in the kind of probably my call traditional or CFI space, I guess. Um, so I, I worked as a kind of technology and management consultant with a lot of you know, sort of big name clients, large investment banks, major international stock exchanges and things like that on their on their trading platforms, design and build. Uh, but I got into got into Bitcoin pretty early. I'd been reading about it for a while and started mining in about 2013. Uh, acquired some Ethereum in the pre-sale as well. So really started getting getting into the space and I've always been very, very interested in kind of decentralization and cryptography, uh, but also in kind of disintermediating the middleman because certainly working in centralized finance, you in a city like London, you discover how many companies just make a ton of money by being in the middle of things that ordinary people and companies have to do. And that doesn't feel very fair. And I see this as kind of a way to way to, to fix some of that. And uh, so when the opportunity came along to start Vega uh, and actually get right to the core of those problems in a way that would be really, really impactful, uh, it was something I just, just had to do. I see. And mate, I also noticed that you have a computer science background when I was reading through some of the, the, the information about Vega. Um, you have a lot of experience in capital markets as well. So do you feel like you have really brought that expertise and utilised that? I noticed also your team is exceptional when it comes to engineering experience. But clearly, you know, you, you do have those skill sets to really lead out and, and support Vega as you build this. Yeah, definitely, and, and I think it's really important. You know, one of the uh, one of my sort of favorite quotes about uh, crypto from uh, Matt Levine at Bloomberg is that uh, crypto and DeFi are kind of doomed to learn all the lessons that the centralized financial system learned over the last three hundred years in kind of rapid speed, but they seem to be learning them one by one. And um, that's something that I noticed. You know, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of very smart people in finance solving real problems, and it's easy to to connect the the problems with finance as it is today. Uh, and, and assume it all needs to be thrown away and start again. And there's actually a ton of real technology problems and market incentive design problems and other things that have been solved uh, in centralized and traditional finance already. And to throw all that away and start again is going to be a very long and tedious process. And so one of the things that really was at the core of founding Vega was to know that we are experts and understand the crypto space and, and how to build blockchains and, and build crypto systems, but also that we're taking that relevant experience and filtering it and throwing out the stuff we don't want to keep, but taking that relevant experience and building something that actually solves the same problems that finance does and hopefully even better and addresses those things up front rather than kind of waiting to blindly discover those issues as you know, as we've seen recently with some of the attacks that happened on things like Visa Dex. And, and, yeah, and those, are, those are all quite predictable things that would, would, would happen with the lack of kind of protections built into markets and the way things have been designed. And we're trying to avoid making too many of those mistakes when we build Vega. And I think the experience that me and, and the rest of the team, particularly actually you know, Tamlin from a markets and trading background, she's a very experienced trader. And David is a, is a very experienced quant, front office quant on the risk side. And you know, their experience particularly as well as mine really helps us build something that avoids the, the well-known uh, pitfalls at least. Yes, and, and certainly as someone who's been researching and just being one of the proponents of education in this space, I've known of Vega for some time and certainly, uh, you know, we've had interactions before and also some of your colleagues in the space and your team members. And that's because obviously there is a dearth of these kinds of provisions built in for DeFi and we're going to explore that in detail, but let's go back to the beginning. Let's, let's discuss, you know, what you stand for fundamentally, what Vega actually is for the audience. And also, just a quick um, piece of information for all those wondering, this is entirely free. This is all about trying, trying to provide education and information for all of those listeners who are wanting to know more about what Vega stands for, but there is no uh, financial incentive for me to do so. This is really just about education. Now, in terms of what you stand for, a protocol for creating and trading derivatives on a fully decentralized network. So that's where the DeFi comes in. Do you want to just touch on those ideas of DeFi and derivatives so we can really understand Vega as a protocol and platform? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to start, I'm going to start with derivatives because I think it's kind of it's interesting to see 
where it fits in. And, and one thing that you'll notice if you look at any major financial sort of system is that the derivatives markets in terms of notional outstanding volume, and that's it's sometimes a troublesome metric. Like if you buy an option for 10 cents and it's on $10 million worth of stocks, it's super out of the money, that's $10 million of notional. So it's not quite the same as $10 million moving around, but you know, the notional size of derivatives markets is hundreds and thousands of times larger than the underlying markets. And regardless of the goodness of that metric, the important thing is that actually derivatives serve a really important purpose. And you know, VCs and investors like to talk about unbundling in terms of companies and startups, unbundling aspects of products and services. And derivatives do that with finance. They unbundle risks. So they let you decide what risks you're happy with, what risks you're not, what risks you'd like to you know, sell to someone else, effectively hedge or, or get insurance against. And that's super important for markets because most people can't control the risks they have financially. Like if you're a manufacturer, you can't control the fact that you're exposed to the price of the metal that you need to build something or the fluctuations in the currencies where you export. But that's not your core business. Your core business is building this thing. And so you might decide that you want to sell those risks to people who do understand them or perhaps people who have the opposite risk. Um, and that's really what the route is allowed. It allows you to sit there and go, right, this risk I don't like. I don't want to have to be exposed to it. I want to sell it. And the goal of derivatives markets, ideally, would be to do that as cheaply and usefully as possible. So to have a very specific derivative that specifically addresses the risk I'm selling. Like if I'm acquiring a certain rare earth metal, I don't want to have to buy a derivative that hedges the price of a different metal. I'd like to buy a derivative that hedges the price of the specific thing I'm exposed to. Mm. And then I want that to be as cheap as possible. Like I don't want to have to pay anything more in fees than I need to. And you know, the problem with the markets today is that both of there are, there's too little breadth because there's a very small number of people who make the markets and decide what gets to be a market. So unless you're a very major company, you might not have access to the market you want. Either it might not be available in your region or the specific market might not be available. And then again, unless you're a big company, unless you're plugged very into the center of the financial system, everyone else pays multiple layers of fees on that. And so you know, the derivatives thing is really important for DeFi because Fixing finance isn't really about fixing in in the long run. If you want to fix the financial system rather than money, it isn't really about fixing who where the trades happen of you know, where I sell my gold for my other stuff. It's about fixing the cost of be participating in that system, and a huge amount of that cost comes through derivatives. But also, derivatives are much more complex than underlying spots. So whereas I can do a you know an atomic swap on Bitcoin's blockchain and trade X for Y because it's just traded, it's happened. I've, I've got rid of my X, you've got rid of your Y, we've made a trade and everything is easy. Mm -hmm. Derivatives have this different feature because they have, a, they have a life cycle, they have a length. So a derivative contract could last a month, or three months. And during that time, we can win and lose money. And so you have to get to this system, has to be able to risk manage that and decide, can Barney afford to pay the losings he's making on this position if he's losing? And that if you just say you have to give me all the money you could possibly owe, some derivatives are impossible because that could be theoretically infinite, but also it's a very expensive trade to enter because you might have a you know, one in a billion chance of owing millions and millions of dollars. But if you ask everyone for the millions of dollars, then the much more likely thing where they only owe 100 is not going to be worth entering the trade. So you know, derivatives tend to be traded on margin for that reason. And Doing those margin and risk calculations safely, i.e. in a way where someone doesn't suddenly owe more than they have, and that puts the whole of the other trader at risk, doing that safely requires computational power. Uh, and the blockchain systems that are available today, like you know, Ethereum, Bitcoin, etc., don't have the raw processing power available in their smart contract systems to do that in a very effective way, which means you have very suboptimal solutions for derivatives in DeFi. Uh, even now, either you take entire parts of it off chain and then you have this kind of asynchrony where there's risk that the chain gets delayed and so you don't get to close someone out until it's too late. Mm -hmm. um, or you make really, really naive assumptions and decide oh, the margin is 25%, regardless of if it should be 2% or 50. And then you, some people get really inefficient capital and other people get to walk away owing more money than they have. And so you know, th th that was the big thing. We were like, no one is solving this for derivatives and you can't do it on Ethereum or on any of those general purpose chains. So we need to design a blockchain that works for that. And that's where the DeFi thing comes in. Because once we started doing that, we realized actually there's a bunch of other problems. So you know, the biggest one mm -hmm. is fairness. And Klaus Kasawi, our sort of lead blockchain researcher, he's been doing um, Byzantine fault tolerance research since like pre, um, pre Satoshi's Bitcoin white paper. Right. He has now come up with the fairness protocol. And the goal of that is to say, the way that you make blocks in Ethereum isn't very fair. Like you know, for DeFi purposes, being able to pay a higher fee to get ahead and get into a block, which is how the Ethereum network actually sequences blocks, that's really bad. Because if I just look at the mempool and go, ah, 
these guys are all incorrectly with Uniswap and I know the market's crashing, so I'm just gonna pay a higher fee and get ahead of them. I don't even need to know the price they put in. I can just get ahead of them and like guarantee that they're getting a worse deal because they've got less money than me. Right. And that's just really bad. Well, let, let me so, just jump in there for a second for the audience, because obviously we can go, we're going to go very deep in some of these details. But what's interesting is that firstly, you mentioned the importance of DeFi. We hear the buzzword of that going right across the blockchain domain right now. And you also nuance some of those key platforms, for example, or you mentioned them, such as Ethereum, not cutting it for the kinds of needs that you needed to build. And thus the protocol comes into play and we'll talk about that. But also just more generally, derivatives themselves, you know, they exist in the mainstream, they exist in sort of centralized marketplaces, they exist all the way to Wall Street. So we know there's strong use case for them. We know that there's a very, very high demand in crypto as well. Arguably, the greatest you know, volume comes from derivatives and that sort of market share. So let's talk about the tech in detail and what sets you apart. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about was the security aspects in building out proof of state, for example, um, and, and how you built your architecture to really showcase that you, you, you are needed and that you are basically providing things that Ethereum and others could, couldn't provide. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you mentioned like sort of two things here. One, one was around security and then around sort of showcasing that we're needed. So I'll start with the, the second one because it kind of follows on from, um, from what I was talking about a minute ago. And um, so the first thing there is one of the things I strongly believe is that we are not going to and are not trying to replace it. Here. So, you know, I don't think that stable coins and tokenized security should be issued on Vega. In fact, when we launch, we may not even support doing that. Um, I think that the best place to issue them right now is Ethereum. And it's probably going to continue to be, particularly with Ethereum 2 and its sort of performance and speed upgrade. Like, I don't see much reason to move that to Vega. You know, obviously, we could support that issuing an asset as a fairly trivial operation. And if it became demand for it later, maybe we would. But right now, I think the best place to do that is on Ethereum. And it's really not something we're interested in sort of competing with. And we love that ecosystem and want to be able to sort of tie them together. So Vega is integrated into the Ethereum ecosystem with a bridge contract, which allows you to trade ERC-20s and, and Ether on Vega. So really you're not trading anything else, not creating new things, and you will eventually even be able to take out a position on Vega using an Ethereum smart contract by the bridge as well. So really seeing ourselves as part of that ecosystem not replacing it. But the need right. for it comes, you know, when I was talking about that fairness problem where someone can get into a block um, where they shouldn't be able to, and they can get ahead of other traders because they've got more money than them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the research that Klaus has just published allows us to build a protocol that actually sequences blocks differently and provides a certain level of guarantee of fairness. And he did a great talk at uh, Dystopia Labs uh, recently, which is online, which you, can, which you can sort of learn more about that. And the paper will be out soon as well. Uh, but that's one of the aspects. We need it because we need fairness. Because no one who trades on the serious current markets and who's trying to sort of seriously use derivatives to manage their business, no one is going to enter into a marketplace where they believe that people with lots and lots of money can screw them over by paying for placement in a block. And so that fundamentally is going to be a barrier to adoption. And that's one of the major reasons we focus on it. And then obviously the other reason I mentioned around the fact that you just can't run complex derivative products with efficient use of capital in a safe risk managed way on something like Ethereum because of the speed of the overall network. Uh, and that's the other thing we've done is instead of, you know, if you look at Ethereum, you've kind of got this thin EVM layer, which provides a, a virtual machine that can run any contract, right. but it's, it's generality is also its weakness here because it can run any contract, but it runs it kind of slowly. Whereas what we've done is we've built a very thick virtual machine layer that contains lots and lots of financial primitives. And this is something where the, the, the trading experience and the finance experience comes in because every major bank has these systems. They have big libraries of risk algorithms, big trading platforms. They have these huge technical infrastructures for managing and valuing and trading and settling financial products. They build that stuff once and then they mm. have a sort of higher level language, a data format, if you like, or a domain specific language for specifying the products that reuse these things every time. And look at DeFi today, like every single, every new lending protocol has a new protocol. Like despite the fact lending is just a subset of taking out a position, it could just be buy, sell. The protocol could be the same for every DeFi contract, but it's not because everyone rewrites all of the fundamentals of trading every time they put a protocol live on Ethereum. On Vega, it's totally different. We're like, right, but this stuff needs to work fast, it needs to be safe, it needs to be well tested, and it needs to manage risk effectively and provide capital efficiency. We build it once, we build it super efficiently, and then every product built on top is a much thinner layer of product that can access and reuse all those things. It can have an auction mode based trading, it could, it could have a bonded curve based trading, it can have continuous order book based trading, whatever the best trading mode for that product is. 
but it reuses the stuff built into Vega and it means that it gets the upgrade. You build a better trading mode, you make it faster, lower latency, safer. Every product gets that. The products are much simpler to build uh, and, they, and they work much faster and much more sort of the better risk management and all of those things. So you're really doing those things, putting that all together into one network and then connecting it up to the Ethereum ecosystem. Got it. kind of what allows us to give something that attack, it sort of get, feeds that demand um, and hopefully feeds the demand that's currently getting diverted to centralized crypto exchanges because the sort of sophisticated on-chain solutions aren't, aren't there yet. I see. And one of, the, one of the things that you have coined in your white paper and even in some of the discussions is the idea of democratizing derivatives. Now, just to be clear, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially you're a specialized protocol. You spent years with your team building this out to optimize uh, the, the whole point of what you're trying to do, which is essentially offer a whole suite of products um, of derivatives themselves um, and doing so with high throughput, low latency and, all, and even low cost. So that once again, you've spent the time building out a high quality protocol. Now in doing that, obviously, you know, it's taken, it's been quite an arduous, pro, uh, arduous process, but are you also a platform? Because that's what I wanted to also clarify with you in being a protocol, are you also op uh, uh, you know, uh, providing for a proper you know, facility that is regarded also as a platform for people to utilize? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the things that I always, we always have sort of debates about, and it's very difficult, it's like, what's in a platform, a protocol, a network, it's kind of all of those things, right? You know, the protocol tells people how to interact with the platform, and the network supports it all, uh, and they're all very interlinked. And I definitely think the platform aspect is really important. And that means that, you know, when the protocol is live on a network, there is a platform that someone can go to and say, I understand the product, and I would like to launch a market in that product, you know, we, we had conversations, for instance, with people who are launching a spot exchange for um, hash rate, hash rate future, no, sorry, spot hash rate. They're launching a spot hash rate exchange and they're interested in hash rate futures. And they're like, well, maybe we've got a business plan where we're going to raise $3 million and go and build a centralized exchange for hash rate futures. <laughs> now, in some markets that makes sense and is, is worth doing even now, but in other markets, that's just too much money and is, that market doesn't get created. When Vega is alive, no one will need to do that. Because instead of, and we're talking to these guys about not doing that, because we're saying to them, well, if you wait for Vega, which we're building anyway, and is in testnet now and works, then it will cost you maybe a few thousand dollars to do the research and work needed to basically parameterize a product and make a proposal on the Vega network. And then as long as the Vega community believes the proposal is in good faith and it's not fraudulent, that's going to get voted onto the kind of listed markets of the network. And that's not something we control. That's something the network's you know, users and, and, and token holders control, that product will get voted on, it'll become tradable as a market and you didn't need to build a centralized exchange and you didn't need to, to do any of those things. And so you can spend the $3 million uh, attracting liquidity providers and you know, going out to the market to get them to use your exchange instead of somewhere else. And so you know, right. really the opportunity there to, to create a product and to also, you know, the power of the democratization is you then share in the revenue. So you know, the trading fees are dynamic, but they go to the market creators and the market makers who support that market. So, mm. so you, you use your $3 million to bring in business and trading on the market, you deploy the product, you become a market maker, market creator in that, you now own a kind of a stake in that market as far as the protocol is concerned. And every time people trade, they're going to pay a, a small fee and they, then you're going to make some revenue for having created this thing that the, that the, the, that the community uses. And so and, and it really also that shows, transformation. And sorry to interrupt, but that also shows the scope of what you're building because you're an end-to-end -end uh, sort of system, you know, if, if that's okay to, to describe it as, or a technology that provides for the, the all the way from the, the, plat, the platform itself and also the derivative technology that underpins it. But in terms of trust, for example, when we talk about permissionlessness, um, having listened to some of your discussions, that's really you know, important, obviously, to the whole team. So where does that fit in when we, when, when we know that we can engage as it's ready in the protocol, it's open to, as you mentioned, an opportunity for people to create products utilizing the protocol, but you also offer key products as well. So how does one engage in the world or in the spectrum of, of permission permissionlessness in what many people are deeming the C fi to DeFi spectrum? How do you situate yourself along those lines and, and with regard to trust, for example? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think we will never create a we'll never create a system where you need to rely on us to trust the network. So we'll never be kind of starting C five. So it'll never be the case that we have access to your funds uh, that you're trading on Vega with, or that we can censor your market. 
Uh, when Vega launches, it's likely that there will be a relatively small number of validator nodes operated by like the largest token holders or sort of stakeholders, again, with no contractual relationship or no structural organizational relationship to Vega at all. Uh, there'll be external people, but there'll be a relatively small number of them probably, and they will be running the nodes. So, uh, and that gives us a sort of, not quite centralization, but a sort of a permission nature in that those people will be people who we probably know who they are and we can talk to and we can kind of say, hey, look, this is how it's going. We need to deploy this security update or, or we've seen a fraudulent, fraudulent market being proposed. We need to make sure we vote that down. They don't have to listen to us. There's certainly nothing that will force them to, but as long as we're not being malicious, they probably you know, will work with us to get the right solution out there. But certainly there will never be a point where if we decide to access your money or to close down a market you created, we will just not be able to do that. I say so. You know, so really in the direction of you know what many people deem as that, that pure DeFi goal, but you're being pragmatist about you know moving in that direction and, and doing what you need to uh, to cater for what is essentially a transformative or very innovative technology. Now, what are what are the benefits, Barney, of DeFi when it comes to things like price, when it comes to things like composability? Obviously, they need to be built in, the value sets there, uh, especially given that if you do a comparative analysis often centralized parties can be cheaper, they can be faster. So how do you compete in, in that sphere? And how do you offer products that are you know, underpinned by technology that can really uh, meet those benchmarks and then go beyond that? Yeah, so definitely. So cheaper is one where actually the long-term DeFi should be cheaper. And if it's not, it's probably because you're using the wrong blockchain or the wrong protocol. And what I mean by that is like, if the transactions are just super expensive, then maybe the blockchain is wrong. And you know, one of the things I always think about is, is Ethereum requires you to pay for every transaction in gas. And that's actually bad. You talk about prices, that's bad for prices because if, if a market's gonna be a primary source of prices, so if you're, if you're like Uniswap, you're not a primary source of price, you actually require an arbitrage to a centralized or another exchange to setting the price in order for Uniswap's price to work. So that's not, this argument isn't as true for them, but if you're, the primary source of price, then what you need is as many signals from the market of the true best price for something as possible. So if you then charge someone gas, which is a variable fee, every time they send you a price signal in the form of an order, um, then you're getting best, best, worst price determination. So for Vega, submitting transactions with new orders is free. Uh, we use a kind of client side proof of work to avoid spam and orders, that along with the margin requirements, but the actual order doesn't cost you anything. So unless it trades, you're not gonna pay any fees to Vega. That means we get better price determination, which means you get more accurate prices more quickly. Um, and then in terms of the cost of the network, because all, like I mentioned before, that kind of thick layer of finance primitives is running on the bare metal, it's running super fast. That means that actually we can provide much lower cost um, to run a market overall than having to rely on external kind of sources of risk management and things like that, or, or having to use the Ethereum VM and pay gas. And so mm -hmm. over the long term, I believe that you should be able to make the cost of trading on Vega should be not far off the cost of the infrastructure. You know, obviously they're gonna to want, to, yeah, to want to take their little smaller slice of the pie, but the actual incentive mechanisms in Vega are designed to balance the fact that the cheaper it is, the higher the trading volume and, and vice versa. So actually, in, and as you see in centralized markets, actually even with high, with high trading volume, fees go down in centralized markets because mm -hmm. doubling the volume is better than getting 10% more fees. Um, and that's often kind of the relationship you have. And the same will be true in Vega, but because you're not having to pay any of these middlemen, they're sort of centralized costs. Um, you're only paying people to provide a real service. You're paying for the cost of running the server. You're paying for the cost of, you know, the, the risk capital for providing liquidity, but you're not paying for a centralized middleman who's rent seeking. Uh, the cost overall should be lower. And the lower cost means you get lower spreads on the price as well, because if you know, one of the ways people recoup their cost is by having higher spreads you get higher volume so the virtuous cycle should mean that cost and price wise vega is good um, performance wise that's something we're working on we sort of have a just under one second block time in testnet probably an average about 0 0.81 0 0.82 seconds in testnet last time i checked it might go up a little bit as we have more nodes for mainnet but we also have some research in the works where we might be able to get an order of magnitude better um, look out for a thing called flocking on that which we'll, we'll uh, probably be coming up with in the, within the sort of next year ish so it won't be there at launch but it'll be a uh, the thing we add and that will be able to give us kind of like you know maybe 50 millisecond latency or something in the long term mm. so, and, and they uh, can be really significant um you know changes to the overall uh, outcome overall experience obviously for the user because many of them won't see all of the intricacies of the technology underneath when they do you know interact with your your the interface 
and the user experience obviously yeah, wants to be seamless. We've onboarded a few people recently to the interface, and one of the the regular comments is people actually, if you're a real, if you're a trader who trades a lot, you know it's the notice is a little bit slower than a decentralized platform. If you're not a regular trader, if you just trade occasionally or if you don't trade much, people are just sort of like. I can't tell this is using a blockchain. Like it, and Barney, it that's works. quite amazing. I'm sorry to interrupt, but the, the reason why I've always wanted to talk to you is because you did spend so much time with your team in building this protocol, which is unlike many, to be honest. I mean, the amount of time, the amount of resources, the amount of money is involved in building this out is substantial. So do you, do you just want to touch on the time you took to build this out so that that user experience um, and that UI is so seamless and is so good and, and is so competitive? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you know when you look at um, it's very difficult. You can't compare this to something like a, an Ethereum-based DeFi protocol because they're just building one layer of the stack, and we need to build all of the layers. And we, we are, you know, we're not building everything from scratch. You know, we're using Tendermint as the underlying blockchain, and uh, you know, we're, we're, the, the system we're building is actually a bit blockchain agnostic. So if Tendermint turns out not to be the most performant or secure option in future, we can actually swap that out, or we can fork it and improve it um, mm -hmm. over time with our research. Uh, we're using Tendermint at the moment, so we didn't build the very bottom consensus layer from scratch, um, but we are customizing it. Um, and really what we focus on with the time is getting the protocol right. And it's kind of, it's one of those things, you know, sometimes you can iterate something and you can build a, build a version, put it out there and say, okay, let's just MVP iterate. And that's very easy on a, if you're building an app and it's very easy if you're building something relatively small, but there are a lot of parts of the, pro of the protocol that fit together. So you've got to build, a, you've got to build the, the trading the price determination, you know, how trading works. You've also got to build the kind of protections in, so the kind of things that stop um, people from manipulating the price or stop the market from getting dangerous if the liquidity is very, very low. You have to build well, those protections. We, we saw the likes of Black Thursday, so we don't want to see those again. So uh, obviously, yeah, you know, exactly. it's imperative that that be built in. So yeah, please go on. Yeah. And then, uh, and then obviously, you know, on top of that, we've got to build the risk management. We've got to build how it settles everything. We've got to build the bridge to Ethereum so people can trade their Ethereum assets. Like, there's no way I was going to launch Vega with a kind of, hey, there's this network here, but you have to trade some weird asset we created. Like, people don't want to do that. So and you have to build that bridge to Ethereum. You also have to build the risk management stuff. And then alongside that, we've got a small team building what we call Vega Console, which is a D app, entirely decentralized. There's no centralized servers involved, but it's a, it's a very sort of, Professional quality trading front end with kind of you know, configurable layout, multi monitor support, uh, ability to kind of really, really organize your workspace how you want and see and, and use every aspect of the protocol. So it's not like if you want to propose a market or get involved with some of the other decentralized aspects of the protocol, it's not like you have to drop into writing code. We're actually exposing all those things via that Vega console. And anyone can go and write code and interact with the whole protocol via code they want as well. There's no restrictions on that. It's an open, open protocol, and open network. But by providing a kind of so sort of professional front end so that people who aren't coders can access and get and use Vega on the same terms as those who do understand the tech. Uh, we're sort of doing all those things in parallel um, mm. because we think that it's important that when Vega launches as a network and when people come along to use it, you know, one of the differences to some of the other protocols that have been created is that we need people who are traders by profession, not coders, to come and support this because we want there to be liquidity, we want there to be good prices. And so you know, we're really focusing on that kind of end-to-end -end experience you know we're in testnet now so we, we're kind of you know, if you like de-risking you know, we, we started seriously building the production version of this at the beginning of last year when we raised our seed funding mm -hmm. and you know we're in testnet now sort of about a year later uh, so you know a year of building that's out there in testnet and then by the end of the year we'll be in a sort of mainnet alpha so yeah that's really important to us to get that end-to-end -end thing working and to really demonstrate something that shows people how it's a step forward because if we launch something really really early that wasn't a step forward and was just kind of kind of difficult to use and kind of worse than what's out there already, then we're not really helping. And, and we have some amazing investors who have been willing to support us and say, yeah, this is a five, 10 year journey to do this. And so, you know, mm -hmm. take the take the one or two years it needs to build build the first version right. Yeah. And Barney, much respect, different. much respect to you also for doing that because that clunkiness, you know, that you alluded to, that can happen, you know, by that premature release of code or of of technology, it's already been evident in the the crypto space now, where people have rushed, you know, in 
to try and capitalize on sort of the nascency of this space, but really they weren't ready. So I'm, it's great to hear from you that you didn't do that with your team. You're making sure that everything, all the, all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed and all of the hard work has been proven and tested and hence the test nets now as you move forward towards mainnet. Now, in terms of features... Yeah, there will be some rough edges, to be sure. Yeah, and they're always <laughs> going to be, obviously, because nothing's set in stone. But, you know, having known and followed your team for some time, it's clear that you've gone into a lot of detail, you know, a lot of, lot of depth when it comes to getting that code right, making sure that, again, that user can really engage because in the, the day you do need users and you do want to track that, that sort of a, a large part, a lot, a lot of market share, arguably, in such a competitive space. So to do that, you also need to have good quality features built in. And some of the things mentioned are things like built-in liquidity, um, and then uh, connected blockchains, collateral is another thing that's mentioned, pseudonymous participation, and a straightforward uh, market creation. So do you want to just touch on those a little bit, all the ones that you think are the most important to reference in, in terms of your value? Yeah, and so we already talked a bit about Sedona's participation and, 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 and the kind of decentralized network and obviously the same in Vega. And, and we do have some tools that we're building which won't be available at alpha release, but will be available later around compliance for people who have regulatory needs in a pseudonymous environment. But um, perhaps that, that, that might be a talk another time because there's a lot of detail there and it's, it's not okay. kind of straight yeah. away. We can, we can always um, defer that to a detailed of, one. <laughs> Yeah, and it's super important in the long term that people can feel they're compliant in any regulatory regime, and that's the something we're very focused on. But you know, the the alpha launch won't won't have all of those tools. Um, but the one I think is probably worth really digging into a bit is the liquidity part, because there are two reasons this is super important for a decentralized platform. The first is I see this weird thing when people launch something that's fully decentralized, but they retain the con complete control over like the website that you actually go and log on and, and what markets are tradable. And that seems like you're missing an opportunity because if you're going to do that, why aren't you just running a centralized exchange? You literally just say, I don't want to do the, I don't want to talk to the regulator and get a license to run a centralized exchange. Like if you're going to control all the markets, then I don't really know why maybe you want to be non-custodial and that's beneficial, but you can do non-custodial stuff. But it, the, so to me, it's really important that if you're going to decentralize the protocol, you actually decentralize the protocol, including the creation of markets and you give to the community the ability to create new things and new markets and products that you hadn't thought of. You know, Ethereum's success, I would say a large part of Ethereum's success comes down to the creation of the ERC-20 standard. Mm -hmm. As soon as that standard was created, every new token that was issued was getting issued on Ethereum because people could build tools around it. And as soon as every token and every stable coin got issued on Ethereum, that's obviously where DeFi is going to happen. Right. And so I think Ethereum's success comes from that permissionless creation. And we want to have that permissionless creation. So that's one aspect of it. And the liquidity incentives come in there because if you're a market creator and you get an early and you create and support a market early, we have an equity-like model where it's a bit like seed funding a company. If you get in early in a market and it grows, you receive a larger share of the sort of fees that get paid on that market than someone who joins later. And that gives you this really strong incentive to spot the need in the marketplace and to take a risk on creating a new market. You know, it's much cheaper than much cheaper than creating a market and creating a centralized exchange, but there's still not no risk and not no time. It does require mm -hmm. some effort. So, you know, to reward you for taking that risk when, when it works well, that's an important part of it. And giving you that equity like stake in the future of the market and aligning those incentives is important. And then the other one is just liquidity. Like, firstly, markets are useless without liquidity. I don't know if anyone ever used like Ether Delta or Fork Delta. Like, I, I haven't actually logged in for a while, but when I first did, I noticed that you could trade every single one of 1500 or whatever. You know, had permissionless innovation, great. Every single one of the 1500 ERC20 tokens could be traded with every other one. Problem was, Almost all of those, you know, 1500 by 1500 is like, you know, a lot of markets, but almost all of those had basically nothing on them because no one was using them. So right. part of that is actually saying this network can do that. It's got that permissionless innovation, but in order to make it useful, we're actually not going to just create every market. We're going to ask the community to say, do we want to support this market? And if we do, are we willing to commit for a share of the revenue to providing liquidity? And so what you end up saying is, yeah, this market has been proposed. It's an idea for a market. And if people come in and it's a bit like almost like a Kickstarter, if it reaches its liquidity target, the market can launch and people can know that they can go and trade on it and there will be a real price and there will be orders on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it doesn't reach that target, then you know, it will sit in a pending state for a while and eventually not get created or maybe it'll get created later when the interest increases. Uh, 
So that allows us to ensure that although people can permissionlessly create markets, we're only going to create the markets that once they're created will be useful. Because there's no point permissionlessly being able to do something that makes the platform more confusing because there's hundreds of useless markets that aren't useful. We want it to be, you can permissionlessly create something, it'll be useful. We want to marry those two things together. And then liquidity is also important from a risk point of view because if you, if your position starts going against you, I want to be able to close your position out before you owe more than you have. And just say, sorry, your position's closed, you haven't put any more margin in. Uh, you, can, you can top up your margin if you want, but if you don't, I need to go to close you. And the best way to close you is simply if you bought, then you sell it, and then you sell to someone else. And if there's no one else to sell to, we can't close out your position. And so the network has to take on that risk, or the other participants have to take it on. So, you know, incentivizing liquidity also allows us to properly risk manage everyone's position and keep the whole thing healthy. Um, and so that's why the, the protocol has dynamic fees. So if you have a relatively low liquidity market, the fees will be higher. That means, oh, I would like to market make that market because I can earn high fees. If it becomes high liquidity and there's no problems and there's lots of liquidity, the fees can get lower and lower, which encourages people to trade. So that dynamic liquidity incentivization is absolutely crucial to creating sort of well-functioning markets on Vega. Right. And, and once again, it reinforces that pragmatic approach, building in that market making as well. I notice that's referenced and that relates obviously to your liquidity. Now, one of the things that perhaps you know, we didn't touch on enough is because you did discuss Ethereum, but you are agnostic, you know, by, by design. And there's also references to your cross-chain capacity. You mentioned Tendermint, so that alludes to the potentials of something like Cosmos, for example. Uh, are there any thoughts on uh, developing this technology to integrate with other platforms in the future with other smart contract platforms um so that you obviously you can expand your reach yeah absolutely i mean I, I really think it's very important to be able to do that i think the most obvious place to go first is bitcoin um obviously most of the institutional and more professional trading that actually goes on despite the success of DeFi, most of the institutional and professional trading that happens in crypto albeit mostly on centralized exchanges is in bitcoin uh, so supporting Bitcoin and token, various token platforms on Bitcoin is an obvious next step and mm. something we're sort of actively investigating but not building yet. Um, and then, you know, then there, there becomes like a sort of bifurcation point and there's a multiple options that we can do. We can, we can go after other direct chain integrations if, if a chain starts to become very, very big, like Cosmos becomes the place mm -hmm. or if Near Protocol comes along and starts displacing Ethereum too because it's there first or something. Right. Like we can come along and go, okay, actually we want to integrate directly with that and we can do that. Then the next option is there are kind of these cross-chain protocols, like, like the interchain stuff that Cosmos are doing, where they're kind of going, actually, we want to be a hub for cross-chain value movement. So we integrate with one of those and then go, actually, now we can kind of trade these assets from multiple chains. And then the other option is the kind of things like I think it's TBTC and WBTC, mm -hmm. where the existing chains, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever, start to wrap tokens from other chains. So actually, once we've done Bitcoin and Ethereum, we might turn it, might discover that people start, people have really good trust this ways of wrapping tokens into ERC-20s and we no longer need to build as much. And so I don't know which of those three ways it'll go. Maybe we'll build a few more direct integrations, maybe we'll do something like the interchange stuff, or maybe more and more tokens will get wrapped on, on Ethereum or somewhere like that and it won't be as necessary. But really that's got to be based on the community's demand. Like if people are banging down the door saying, actually, we are doing massive cross-border payments on Ripple and we want to be able to use Ripple, XRP in derivatives transactions to hedge the risk of those will probably go into great with Ripple. You know, and, and we've heard mm -hmm. some people have said that to us, and then that's one one option, right? And so really it just comes down to what's the community raring to do. I uh, say I don't want to be driven by ideology there. I want to be driven by where can people use this useful. Right. And you know, for someone looking at utilizing your platform, it's great to know that you have that flexibility built in where you can just follow where I guess the users are and yeah. where the interest that, that's lies. That's a huge advantage of being a kind of, you know, one of the advantage of being an ex, uh, sort of our own blockchain that is plugged into other things, kind of like a side chain to all of these other chains mm. is that we're not, you know, inextricably linked to any one of them. Yeah. And that's a big, that's a big deal, especially when you're given that everyone's looking for the best protocol that's going to offer DeFi derivatives and you're arguably going to provide that. Um, so it's advantageous also for those platforms because it's going to increase overall users for them as well. Now, with regard to your phases of development, do you want to just touch on, you mentioned Testnet now. Um, obviously, you know with your team exactly where you want to go. Um, mainnet's obviously a key goal in the future, especially this year. So, What's the, what, the, what are the milestones coming? What's the big plan? 
Yeah, so, so current, I guess what we're kind of doing in the end, we're in a, we're in a private test net and we're in a kind of community expansion phase, if you like. So we started off with some very close collaborators, kind of onboarding people in quite in-depth sessions, because one of the things that I've noticed in my career is that if you give something to a thousand people and ask them for feedback, you'll get a thousand undirected comments that mostly tell you the three things that you can also see if you log in and spend five minutes trying to see what's wrong with this. Uh, whereas if you sit down with someone for two hours who's a trader, and you work with them or you get on a Zoom call with them and talk through what they're doing, you start getting into the nuances and getting useful feedback. So we've been going deep rather than wide initially with the feedback and that's been really, really helpful. What we're starting to do is involve more of the community. So we're starting to kind of reach out into different communities that we're part of and, and our own community and starting to say, look, you know, we'd like to bring you on board and do some of that stuff with you. And you know, we're going to be running some sessions where people can, uh, you know, we like interactive building and building a trading bot on Vega and, and running some competitions around that kind of stuff. And, you're doing similar things with other types of sort of onboarding session and community activity. So we're going to go from kind of just depth first to a little bit of spread into the community and getting more people using Vega. And then with the ultimate goal in the next couple of months, and the exact date is still TBC, but in the next couple of months of having a public test net. So basically going, hey, you can download the wallet, you can create your own ID, and you can go go trade on the public, public test net and start giving us feedback in a, in a more permissionless way. Because I'm really excited to open it to everyone. And um, we also want to make sure that the day we open to everyone, someone in Russia doesn't just log on and DDoS the whole thing. Really yes, and that's what I, that, that is what I wanted to ask you about with regard to GitHub <laughs> as well, because obviously you've spent a lot, long time on this. You want to make sure that you, you can capitalize on the success of this when it is gradually released until those open and public scenarios. So how available is some of the code right now, for example, as you progress more and more towards an open source, completely open source? situation yeah so at the moment not not much is available uh, um, and really there's a there's a trade-off on a small team it's, we're still a relatively small team and that trade-off is the worst look for a, an open platform open source project is not to not to pay attention to its community and its and its issues and its prs and its github and so if we just open sourced everything now we would either have to do all of our development and design work very, very openly with the community, which, which creates quite a serious um, drag on the team. There's a lot of extra to do. And we know a lot of the Yeah, and there's a lot of the designs that are already known and we just need to build it, right? So if we open it and source it now, we have to do everything like that, or we have to kind of ignore the community a bit. Uh, neither of those are a good look. So actually what we're doing now is going, we're going to build this. Like no one is, it's not live with real money. Like it doesn't, seeing the code would be nice for people, but it would be distracting for us. So. As soon as we get to the point where actually we open sourcing some things, you know, like I mentioned, some of these like initial bots and things will be open sourcing. And then as we get towards mainnet, we'll open source more and more. Uh, and eventually with the goal of everything being open. Um, and that's really the approach. And, and the mainnet alpha goal is, is, is Q4 this year. So you know, getting into that public test net, spending a few months there, completing our audits with code audits and security audits, uh, doing some incentivized kind of test net stuff as well. So basically, you know, effectively offering to pay the community for finding bugs and for trying to break the particularly the economic systems within Vega and, and the security. Um, and once we get to the end of that and feel like we have some reasonable confidence, we'll be launching a limited alpha mainnet with sort of a subset of things, you know, run, run by external validators, you know, and all of that. Um, and that, that will be the kind of the first kind of public release with real money. Um, I see. So. And it's great to know that you're taking this time, as I said before, to make sure that all of the checks and balances are in place and that there are those um, clear uh, feedbacks given, those deep um, experimentations from people who actually do trade, who actually do use this. Um, lofty goals in, in some respects, perhaps, for that Q4 target. But it does sound like you're the team that uh, really do achieve each of their targets or to date. So is that fair to say that you're very that you're confident as a team that you are going to meet that deadline? I, I'm going to give it a I'm going to give it a fifty percent confidence. And, and you know, I think we've achieved the big the big headlines. Uh, well, when we first started the company, uh, we managed to get a kind of a basic order book running on a decentralized network really really quickly. And so the first set of targets we created were far too ambitious. They were like, oh, we'll have a mainnet in six months. Um, and as soon as we started trying to design it, we, we knew that that wasn't possible. So, um, and since then we've had much more realistic targets. I think there are a lot of things that should be allowed to delay a mainnet. Like if, if we find things in the audit that need to be done in the code audit, we should not go into mainnet, right? And if, if there aren't a set of 
validators who we think are good people to be the first validators who are ready to run it and who have good practices. And if we aren't ready to do that, we should probably delay launching the mainnet. So, you know, I'd say sort of 50 50. Like, I think we, in terms of all the things we can control, we seem to be in a good place for a Q4 launch. We don't know what's going to happen in those things. If people find big issues, we won't be afraid to say we need to take the time to get it, get it closer to right. But we are also very focused and driven by the idea that getting something with real, real trading, real money, and real products in the hands of the users is the best way to find a lot of these problems and is the best way to kind of iterate to making sure that Vega is really solving problems for people and is something people use. So mm. you know, we're pretty, pretty keen to get there this year. Um, but you know, if any of those big things crop up around security or around the, the mechanism design of Vega, which we find in the, in the test net or something, um, then yeah, we won't be afraid, won't be afraid to do a quarter if we have to. Right. Well, it, it'll make your investors happy to know that, I think, because obviously they want to make sure that you're here for the long term. You want to make sure that you can essentially provide the technology for years to come, you know, decades to come, in fact. Now, if, if anyone wants to go and look at the team and look at the credentials, certainly do so. I won't go into that with you today, Barney, but I did have a look and it is quite quite outstanding the, the depth of engineering experience that is in your team, I will say. Now, with regard to the use cases, I wanted to touch on more specifics of that because, again, deriv derivatives themselves are you know, a very collective term. So if we talk about things like betting, options, insurance, futures, you've referenced these in your talks. But there's a plethora of potential here. Um, where do you want to focus you know, in on when you, when you do have those active users from the, from the get-go? Yeah, and, and to me, the, the key is the back, goes back to that liquidity thing, right? So the protocol wants to incentivize liquidity. The liquidity incentives only pay you if other people trade. Like if you just sit there providing liquidity, there's no money in the system to pay you. So really, we're actually working with the community. We have a thing called the Market Maker Early Access Program. And you know, obviously, if anyone is a market maker and market making organization and wants to chat about that, please get onto Twitter or contact me or something. Um, but that program is about effectively saying to the market makers in our community who are really interested in what Vega is doing. Firstly, we want to educate you. So we want to say, this is what Vega is. This is how it works. This is why it works like that. that. This is, these are the incentives. Then we want to collaborate and say, okay, does this work for you? Here's the revenue model. Does it make sense? Would you be able to use this if it was in the right product? And then we want to work with, with a subset of those, those market makers to say, you know, actually, who's actually interested enough that they're keen to launch something in, on, on day one and provide liquidity. And so, we're allowing that market maker early access program and that group of people to direct our, our interest of, of where we focus rather than making it sort of my pet project or Tamlin's or whatever. And um, certainly the, the initial interest we've seen, firstly, weirdly actually, I was, I was surprised by this a little bit, is Bitcoin US dollar. I was like, well, surely everyone just BitMEX, right? Well, everyone uses BitMEX. But actually what we've seen is a lot of people saying, we are ideologically uncomfortable with how much of our money is it on BitMEX, or maybe we don't, we're not certain it's safe, or maybe they close the, close the exchange for an amount of time every I, I wonder every why. <laughs> we've seen um, and so, happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we've actually seen more and more people say, you know, we don't want to stop trading on BitMEX, but we'd love to put some of our money on a fully decentralized non-custodial platform. So a bunch of market makers are interested in just launching that kind of Bitcoin US dollar. And the great thing about that is everyone knows how to trade it. So it's a very easy first step. So probably almost certainly someone is going to launch that market at launch, mm -hmm. I would guess. Uh, and the other areas of focus, you know, I mentioned hash rate derivatives. We know some people are really interested in that. Uh, some of the, uh, some of um, some sort of friends of some of our investors in South Korea, actually, who are a market making firm out there, have come to us with a business plan for launching uh, effectively like CFDs on stocks. So kind of like, you know, leverage synthetic exposure to like US stock prices um, based on stable coins over in Korea. And, you know, they think that there's a big market for that and they'd like to launch something like that potentially. So, you know, that's another potential option. And we're working with these market makers on those. Uh, so there's a really wide range. And what I'm really keen to do actually is to say within a few months, people can see the range. Like they can see you can do a crypto US dollar. You can do you know, something like Euro US dollar as well. Like to actually say you can just hedge a normal currency risk. Maybe we do, maybe someone would be interested in launching something like an oil futures contract. It's been in the news a lot recently, uh, so maybe that would be something that would be a fun thing to launch. To say, hey, you can do oil futures with with Dai or something, you know? Yes, yeah, so um, I was going to reference Dai because I know how big you are on trustlessness, and Dai also obviously correlates there. So there's that potential and that scope for you know, argue, hopefully, you know, more uptake of Dai as you move forward in that derivative space. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and I don't, I, I do not know enough about the ins and outs of the stable coins to have a, have an idea where the surefire winners are. I think the, the interesting question is probably going to be whether you can get away with algorithmic stable coins for serious use in the long term in terms of price stability and risk, or whether you end up needing to have um, asset backed stable coins. There's mm. certainly algorithmic ones have their problems, but maybe for shorter term contracts, it's okay. Um, but yeah, like I think, you know, what we really want is a broad range of markets that demonstrate the applicability of Vega across all these different areas so that people in the community see this and they're inspired to create their own markets and don't sort of pigeonhole it as, oh, it's just for trading crypto, for instance. Got it. Well, it sounds like the scope is immense there. And as we've been talking about, there's a lot of interest in all these different products that, that will come forth as you develop. Um, now, just want to talk about tech for a moment, just to clarify for those who perhaps you know, that are tech minded. Now, you've gone into a lot of detail in your own tech stack. So if we focus on the protocol and we go deep into that, just briefly, um, you have your consensus layer, then you have the, Vita, the Vega protocol engine. Uh, with all of the different aspects built into that and then all the way to the client at the end. So is there any way you could give us a summary just of the complexity, but also the, the integrity, the quality of that tech stack that really enabled for everything to, you know, perform or, or, or continue performing in such a way where you do have, you know, a significant protocol that's highly competitive in this area of finance. Yeah. And I think, you know, integrity and complexity are sometimes two words that are difficult to, yeah, mm. difficult to marry because the more complex, the harder it is to, to prove you've got integrity in, in terms of the software and robustness. And the way the, seat, the, the secret, as far as I, I'm concerned, is it's about managing and compartmentalizing complexity. So actually what you find is the complexity in Vega is emergent. So this tech stack is a bunch of quite simple components wired together in the right way that's had a lot of care and thought, which has emerging complexity. You know, when you take settlement, it just kind of goes, what, how much is this worth? Therefore, let's calculate how much of needs to be sent from person A to person B. It's a very simple calculation. When you take margin, it simply says, what is the size of this position? What is the change in value of the position? Now calculate a margin. When you do trading, it's like, here's my order book and all the orders, match them and produce a trade. And each of those things is a simple enough concept and well understood and easy enough to test. But you wire them all together in the right way. And what you get is that whole Vega thing, which we've just spent like 45 minutes discussing. Exactly, right. Um, and so the way that that's kind of, you know, the integrity comes from managing that complexity and compartmentalizing it. It also comes from, you know, testing it very, very rigorously, getting it out there, getting people using it, letting people look at it and audit it as well. Um, and then the other thing that's important about the complexity is that you don't want to expose the complexity that even if it's emerging complexity, you don't want to expose it to the user. Like, and I don't, I don't know how well I think DeFi does this, like, because if I want to submit a, tra a transaction to, if I want to buy something on an Ethereum-based DeFi protocol, I have to download an Ethereum node and I have to shape an Ethereum transaction and send an Ethereum transaction. If I want to buy something on a centralized exchange, I have to find, connect to a centralized exchange API and send a buy order. Mm -hmm. Now, as a trader, what I'm interested in is sending a buy order, not creating an Ethereum transaction. And one of the things we've built on Vega is the concept of our validator nodes, which is the things that, you know, the core that everything runs. And then an ad a value-added read node layer, which contains databases and APIs, which makes your node look like a centralized exchange. You can connect to it as a developer and go, submit order, here is my details. And it will send you back a reference, which you can then query the node and find out the price and the trading and how it's going up. You can send a cancel, you can send an amend, and you don't know there's a blockchain. You, you, know, you have a wallet with some private keys over here, you unlock that wallet and provide that info to this API that runs on your node, mm -hmm. but then you treat the API like it's a centralized exchange. You don't have to worry about there being a blockchain. And I think that's really, really important. You can use, you know, you can query the blockchain if you want. You can look at every block. You can run a block explorer. We have a block explorer running internally. We'll open that soon as well. You, you, know, you can do all those things if you care about it as a blockchain, want to look at blocks and verify signatures. But if you want to trade, you can treat your node as a centralized exchange and just trade. And that's music to the ears once again of the trader because it's easy, it's going to be performance, it's going to be competitive. And then for those who are the devs in this space, they're going to be looking deeply into all of the different details of this tech stack because they're going to play around with it, no doubt, to build out their own products and, and experiment with your platform. Um, what about the token though, Barney? Um, I wanted to ask you more about that in, in, with regard to the overall tokenomic design, the overall uh, sort of fuel for your ecosystem, for your platform and protocol. Um, what is the plan there with regard to uh, the likes of, you know, tokenization? Yeah, so the, the Vega token itself, you mean, yeah? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so that token is, I mean, it's a proof of stake network, right? So the, the primary goal of that token is for you to be able to state that token or delegate it uh, to act as a validator or delegate it to a validator to vote and support that validator. Um, also to participate in those governance decisions. So when people propose markets and want to change some parameters on the network, that can be done via a governance vote. And there's a bunch on that in the white paper, but uh, that's a really important part of the network as well. And for delegators, you'll either be able to keep hold of that governance vote yourself and delegate just the kind of staking aspect of the token, or you can delegate the governance vote as well if, mm -hmm. you, if you don't feel like you know enough to, to participate. Um, so that's really what happens. And, you know, it's worth you know, worth talking a little bit about, about the, the, the upside for the token holder, obviously, is in terms of fees. Uh, something that's really interesting about that is the, the fees come in the underlying currency of the market, which I think is really cool because if you create a blockchain where you're charging people a certain amount per transaction in a kind of general purpose token, then what happens is everything ends up correlated to the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum because that's the price of transactions on blockchains. Mm -hmm. But we've seen this recently. If you look at some of the most more recently launched decentralized sort of trading networks, you've seen their token prices have started to become uncorrelated because they realize that the revenue you get from running from having the token is related to the trading volume, not the price of Ethereum. And particularly if a lot of that trading is happening in stable coins like USDT or DAI, then why would your price be correlated with Ethereum or Bitcoin? If 80% of the trading is in Euro and US dollar stable coins, then the price is going to be more correlated with the euro and the US dollar. So mm. you know, your income stream and the price of the token should be correlated with the underlying assets people are trading and the amount of volume on Vega. So basically, you know, the price goes up and the revenue goes up if more people trade on Vega. So, um, right. And that's, that's important that's because there's a real lack of correlation you know, with regard to the, the protocol and platform in question and the token itself. Often we see this complete coupling with, with with bitcoin's movement for example btc's movement um with regard to many of the so-called altcoins out there so if we just go back to your design when we talk about that delegated proof of stake or the, the, that model um some arguments you know in the space right now they're saying that uh often stakings used really as a means to try and reduce supply or circulating supply that's out there and treat it more as a sort of a, a means of deposit in a bank so how do you get around that kind of argument when Clearly, it's designed for uh, real utility and trying to essentially fuel the whole protocol that you're building. Yeah, I mean, so as I said, because fees are not paid, like you don't need Vega tokens to trade on Vega. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in that respect, the, the supply doesn't need to circulate very fast. Like it is much more like owning a share in, in the network. Like, um, but one of the things that we do want to do is encourage community ownership. So obviously, if it if you just leave it as it is, then eventually you could end up with a small number of people owning large amounts of it. And right. Because the way you invest in these things, that was almost, almost the starting point and it could get worse from there. Uh, so what, we, what I expect to happen, and this won't happen initially at launch because I think initially at launch um, we'll, be in, we'll be in kind of a progressive decentralization mode, as I mentioned, where we have a certain number of kind of known validators who start off and we kind of open up to the token holding community as validators. But eventually what I expect to happen is there to be some, um, some way of distributing tokens to people based on their usage of the network. So effectively, um, if you've staked your tokens, maybe you receive a 10% return every year in fees, but it costs you one or 2% every year in, in tokens. And you can buy those tokens back with the fees if you want, or you can lose them. Uh, and then, Equally, if you're trading and you've paid that amount in fees, you paid that amount in fees, but you receive some tokens as a thank you for being involved and for being a user and as, as a kind of a way to get users invested in the platform. We haven't worked through the full economics of that model and exactly how it'll work, whether it'll be everyone, every token holder is taxed or whether it'll be like token holders who don't delegate or ones who do and receive income. Like, there's a bunch of different ways you can do that and whether you can mm. treat it as a tax or some other method. Um, and then equally, who do, who do you actually give tokens to? Do you give it to the market makers? Do you give it to every trader? Do you give it after they get a certain threshold? Do they have to register? There's a load of questions there, and there are open research topics within Vega at the moment of how best to do it. But right. certainly, you know, if we get out of our alpha mode and start to open up more community participation in validating and in governance, uh, what we will do, um, and you see some of this, you know, people like Compound doing the same, sort of progressively increasing their community access and involvement and stakeholding in the governance. And we will do the same thing. Like effectively, once we resolve those research questions, we will create a way that 
members of the community and people who are active on Vega and use Vega and create value uh, are rewarded in tokens, even though it doesn't cost them tokens to trade. I see. And I like that you're still working towards that through open research, because obviously, you know, many parties, they start with, you know, thinking about the token itself. Uh, and they tend to be those that are really trying to capitalize on price appreciation as opposed to the, the integrity of the protocol that you're really building. So it's great to hear the approach that you're taking there. Um, and it'll be interesting to see the developments that you make with regard to yeah, that. Yeah, my view on this is a, is a really interesting thing. You know, a lot of people kind of are like, how can we make people buy the token and pump the price and make it valuable? Right. Like, we hear that a lot. Um, to me, the way that'll make the thing will make it most valuable will be if trillions of dollars of derivatives are trading on it, because then everyone's worth the tokens is going to be making a lot of money. Hmm. The next thing will make it the next most valuable will be if people think that trillions of dollars of derivatives are going to be trading on it. Not if people think someone in finance is going to buy it next week. You know, no matter how many people are going to pump it, that's not the real source of value. The real source of value is people really think there's a chance that huge amounts of derivatives are going to be traded on this. And so we're entirely focused on proving to people that huge amounts of derivatives are going to be traded on it and not proving to people that someone is going to buy it next week. I see. And, you know, I'll look forward to talking to you more about that token, you know, plan as it moves forward and as it becomes more clear for your team. But I want to also talk about some of the things we do see emerge in some of those centralised entities, like, for example, Binance, when it comes to uh, the comment commentary about 100x leverage or 125x leverage those kinds of very you know in what what many would regard as unpalatable sort of risk are, are you concerned at all about that given that that because of those kinds of advertisements that are just you know saturating the space that many people flock to those platforms um, and perhaps aren't really aware of the immense risk involved in those kinds of uh, derivative offerings and lose a great deal. I mean, some of us call it the wrecked rate in, in that it's very, very high for many people who just aren't aware of these kinds of products that are, are available. Yeah, and this falls on, I mean, you know, in, the, in the UK, certainly the same argument happens around spread betting. You know, there's huge, high leverage. Government has recently introduced a bunch of things, which I think also actually would include any crypto platform which was operated in the UK as well, like around how much leverage you can offer a consumer who's not classed as a sophisticated investor. And, right. You know, ultimately the same problem exists, it's gambling. And at a certain point, unless you are an ex very experienced risk manager, above a certain amount of leverage, you really shouldn't be probably taking it. I don't know whether regulation is the right answer. I suspect it might not be a very good answer. I suspect educating people on risk is better. Um, but it is a problem and it's something, you know, in crypto, we, we've enabled a bunch of, a, a lot of gambling in, in the guise of trading. And it's something we're very, very keen not to do in Vega. And one of the, one of the things we try and do is actually, we probably will eventually end up showing you the amount of leverage you have. But I, we much prefer to talk in the, in the terms that professional traders use, where you talk about how much capital you're using, your margin. Like right. you say, I've got a trade with a notion of 100,000 and I'm using $15,000 of margin. Now I can calculate that you know, six, six times leverage or whatever that is. But... Really what I want to know is how much capital is it costing to have this position I want? And I want this position because I believe X or I'm trading off X risk. And I've got enough capital to pay that margin even if it goes up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so professional traders talk about risk and margin, not leverage. And we are trying, one of the things we're trying really hard to do with Vega is to give people all the same tools professional traders have. Like if you look, you know, look at a spread betting operation in, or you know, something like that, in their trading room where they hedge the risk their clients are taking, they will have price graphs and trading platforms that will, it will show them their risk. It'll show them how risky they're being and where their biggest risks are and what their size of their position is. If you go and look at things like the actual platform they're exposing to the consumers, it shows alerts that might make you want to trade and flashing lights and trade ideas and indicators that you can use to convince yourself you know that the price is going to go up. And so there's a mismatch, you know, they, they've got all this information about their risk and they know how to make a profit safely, but they're exposing to their users flashing lights and things that excite them and make them want to take a risk. Exactly. What we kind of want to do, Vega is flatten that and go, everyone gets professional tools. If you're trading on Vega, what we're going to show you is how much risk you might take, what that could mean, you know, how likely you are to lose that position over 10, 20, 30 minutes, an hour, two days. And so we want to give you the same professional tools that everyone else has in their trading rooms and say, this is how it works. And sure, if you end up gambling, you end up gambling. But I definitely think some platforms are just going after the gamblers and going after that high leverage and, and whatever. And certainly with Vega, we're trying to avoid doing that. You know, obviously, you can't choose who trades on a permissionless network, but we're very much trying to say this is 
this is built for traders and it's built for people who trade and want to trade and know why they want to trade. And mm. it exposes the kind of risk management tools that you need to trade usefully and professionally for your business or because you know, it's your job or whatever else it, it is. You know? So and that's I really the way it and Barney, I have a lot of respect for that approach because um, I don't know if you know, but I'm very vocal about the kinds of risks that many of these young people in crypto are taking with these high leverage platforms and don't have that education and don't have the tools and don't have the knowledge. But what you're saying is you're taking a reverse approach. And I really do genuinely respect that, mate. I wouldn't be talking to you if I didn't, where you're trying to make sure that they are, they are provided with all of the, the options of information, the whole suite of tools to really give them the best chance to make informed decisions as they start to engage in this world of tra trading, of derivative trading. So how do we though uh, circumvent the problem though, if we look at the core problem as extremely high leverage, when you mentioned in certain regions like in the UK, certainly in, in Australia and other regions, there's caps on uh, some of the, the, the extent to which people can uh, leverage. You also mentioned that's not the core focus of your platform, but how do you redress the risks for those who are still willing to take that and not educate themselves, just run in and try and do and engage in the sort of pure crypto casino and the gambling side? I mean, I, you know, I think there's two things. I think there's education and there's community. Like if, if you educate enough people, then the people who refuse to educate themselves will find that the community of people around them and their friends also try and help like not always, you know, obviously you always get problem gamblers, or whatever, but I like the, the analogy of skiing is a good one. Like skiing is pretty dangerous. And if you went to the top of a black run, strapped some skis on and had never skied before and just point your skis down, you might really hurt yourself and it's going to be a very bad idea. But no one ever does that. And why do they not ever do that? Because they're educated that skiing is pretty dangerous and because the other people around them when they do it also know that that would be pretty dangerous. And so right. anyone who was thinking of doing it, even I, I know people, you know, have gone on skiing holidays with little knowledge and tried to be a bit bullish and go up, you know, having had one half hour lesson, tried to go up and do something. And their friends like say, no, come over here and stop them. And so I think of it the same way. Like, you, you know, we, we're going to a world of permissionlessness. We can't stop people having access. We can, as people who do understand the risks and as people who are leaders in the community, we can try and educate and we can provide resources for that. We can provide models, spreadsheets, graphs, posters, whatever, uh, sessions, you know, all those, all those different resources. YouTube videos, everything we want to educate people on that. And then we can also say that it's a bit like the kind of herd immunity thing people talk about with viruses, right? You know, if 80% if of people are immune to the risk because they understand it and educated, the other 20% will, won't get too far without bumping into someone who helps them. And so you don't actually need everyone to get educated. You just need enough people to know that most people aren't going to do it. And people will always go off the rails and you know, people will always have their own personal demons and, and get addicted to things and stuff like that. And so you're not going to get to everyone, you're not going to stop it. But I think if you have a community that understands that and feels a responsibility to it, and then you educate that community and you educate as many people as you can, I think in general, people will learn, you know, what is too much risk and in general, they will look out for each other. Got it. And it's a great point you make. And also, if you're competitive with regard to price and uh, low latency, high throughput, all the things that they're looking for, they're probably going to gravitate towards you for that uh, seamless experience. But how do you cope? What are your thoughts on the manipulation that does exist in some of the current um, platforms, the centralized platforms in crypto, for example, there's question marks over the, the veracity of the team, or there's question marks about some of the sort of concerning conduct behind the scenes. Of course, and, you know, if you own an exchange, then unless you do something very special in terms of like running quite complex cryptography to prove that you haven't, then it's very, very easy for you to just front run or manipulate or do what you want, you know. And there's different types of manipulation. You can go, oh, don't like this volatility, just going to close the markets, not let anyone trade. Oh, there's a technical issue. Or you can shove your orders in in front, or you can let your friend's orders go in in front and have them pay you for that. But there's a lot of different ways that can go wrong. And you know, ultimately, you have to decide to trust them. And you, if it's the London Stock Exchange, you probably trust them. Like, you know, there's enough audits, there's enough regulators, and they have enough incentive to make money as a very overpriced centralized middleman that it would be ludicrous to imagine, in my view, and I've worked with them, it would be ludicrous to imagine that they would ever even dream of like trying to manipulate the markets to make money. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. But if you're a small centralized crypto exchange, yeah, I mean, you kind of just have to take your chances with both, <laughs> both, both with that and with whether or not they just get hacked and lose your money, you know. And so, I do, I do think you know, one of the 
one of the sad things at the moment is that there's so much of crypto that's decentralized that is ultimately reliant on centralized exchanges. Like if your cool DAP is dependent on a centralized exchange for token liquidity and won't work without it, well, we, we've not built a decentralized application yet. You've built a mostly decentralized application that's still anchored in a centralized marketplace for the core, like, you know, the core sort of life force that gives its protocol meaning and makes it all work. So, you know, really we want to fix that. And I think in the absence of being able to trust everyone to run centralized exchanges and knowing that we don't really want to go back to the model of a small number of very large trusted exchanges, trusted institutions, then, you know, again, it comes back to the fairness protocol paper that Klaus put in, is putting out uh, for Vega, which is about how can Vega prove what level of fairness is giving you? So we go, we define fairness this way. Mm -hmm. We're going to implement the protocol like this. If you verify the code and see we've implemented it like that, we can prove cryptographically that you got that much fairness and that, that nothing that was more unfair than that protocol allows would have got through. Right. Really, with decentralization, that's the only option. You need that proven fairness. Yes. Uh, and it's something no other protocols are really talking about. They're talking about, oh, we mitigate front running by doing X, not we have a protocol that's proven to be fair. Exactly. Yeah, and it all comes down. Yeah. Right. And it comes down to that verification process as opposed to trust. You want to minimize that and allow for that transparency of proof, which you're offering. But also, you're arguably a, a first mover when it comes to DeFi derivatives, you know, right down to the protocol level. Are you confident that that's, the, that's a fair call? that you're really taking advantage now of moving out you know, Q4 for mainnet as something that really is needed, but also there isn't a lot of, there's a dearth of it right now, a true DeFi focused derivative platform and protocol. Yeah, I think, I think it's a very good time for it. I mean, firstly, there are a few, if you take very simple derivatives like synthetic assets, there are a few people who have launched recently, I think, you know, is it synthetics and future swap and people and, and platforms like that doing, doing interesting and cool things on Ethereum and, and other places. And so, you know, there is, there is now some demonstrated other activity and demand in around the fringes of this, but compared to the sort of what I call product parity, which is the idea that we want to be able to say, if you can define, if you can trade this derivatives product in the traditional financial system, you should be able to trade it on Vega. Um, mm. That won't be available on day one, but it's something the platform is built to support. Um, yeah, there's no one doing that yet, as far as I know. Um, and but I think it's a good, it's the right call. Firstly, because with those more simple products that are being launched, and with what's going on in places like BitMEX and Deribit, we're seeing demand for this in crypto products. Secondly, a lot of a lot of the timing comes down to how does crypto go mainstream? You know, DeFi is the most mainstream thing in crypto, and it's still not mainstream. It's just it's just got adoption within crypto, really. mm -hmm. and big. So, but we're starting to see a lot of people, you know, people like Argent building wallets, which make it super easy. Like I can imagine, now I can imagine a wallet app that lets you create both an Ethereum wallet and a, and a Vega wallet at the same time, load it up from a credit card and transfer the money via, an, via a stable coin to Vega. I can imagine that in an app and I can imagine it being as easy as loading up a centralized trading platform. Yes. Two years ago, I couldn't imagine that. There was so much still to build, whereas now we're nearly there. And so we're getting to that point where the people who will actually want to trade derivatives, you know, they're a small import export business. They want to hedge their currency risk where the UI and the regulatory clarity and all those things that are coming are getting to a point where they would actually be able to see this as a real option and actually consider it as a business, consider it as a way to do things. So I think, mm. I think the timing is pretty good. Um, obviously there's going to be, you know, the uptake initially is going to be within the crypto world and that's useful. We'll get our feedback, but we're always kind of looking slightly beyond that to, there are, we know there are lots of use cases where we can make things cheaper, faster, better, create new markets for people outside of crypto. And the crypto engagement and use of this is really just part of a stepping stone to being sort of more generally useful. Right. And it's also, when we look at the, the volume proof, there's only very few, there's very few applications right now, even on Ethereum, that are evidencing um, high volume or significant volume in terms of real uptake. Um, there's a lot of noise out there, a lot of sort of fake volume, as you know. But what's great is that everything's leading in the direction of DeFi, especially in that derivatives market as well. And Barney, just one other question I want to ask you with regard to the investors. Obviously, there's a really strong list of investors and, and they are important. Um, and also, for those wondering, I had to change audio, to change the headphones. But to get back to that, the investors obviously are fundamental to make sure that you can build this protocol out, you have the funding. Do you want to just touch on the nature of that funding? Um, and 
how uh, what their kind of uh, what the agreements are so that obviously we see that they are invested for the long term because we have seen VC type pump and dumps as well. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, the uh, we've been very careful and very strategic around around the investment we took. Uh, seed round last year led by Pantera, um, and you know, all of those all those investors are invested for you know the multi year long term really, um, and certainly that's uh, that's been very important for us, and will continue to be important. You know, as we raise more money uh, in future, we will we will want to do do a similar thing. You know, we're certainly only very very early on this journey, and what we don't want is to kind of um, have most of our money come from sort of hedge fund like trading really we really want to have investors and partners who are there for the long term and these investors have been, been amazing they, you know, they're, they're token investors so you know, they really have aligned incentives in terms of the actual uh, performance of the platform they cannot you know they don't make money if we uh, pivot the company to somehow making money out of the IP or some other weird stuff like they make money if the platform is successful which is excellent um, right. and They've been incredibly supportive. You know, they have been helpful in bringing us uh, market makers to, and introductions in that respect. They've been incredibly patient and helpful in onboarding. We've onboarded almost all of them to the test net, and they've many of them have spent several hours with us on Zoom calls. You know, just going through, you know, giving feedback, using the test net, and providing their insights. So we've been, mm. we're incredibly lucky to have that kind of investor base. Um, and, and what about lockups, Barney? As well, have you have you locked up your investors so that they? genuinely are there contractually for the long haul as well? Yeah, absolutely. Everyone is, uh, everyone is, every investor is locked up. I can't remember the specifics, but it's certainly, um, it's long term. Certainly, yeah, every investor is currently locked up. Um, as as uh, you know, Ramsey and I and, and the rest of the founding team, uh, in terms of our incentives there as well. So everyone is kind of locked up. And again, as we go to the future through to mainnet and beyond and, and, and future rounds, there will be, continue to be kind of, you know, we'll, we'll be aiming for sort of locked up, uh, locked up holdings. Right, and I do apologize having to ask that. It's just that obviously we've seen all kinds of things happen in the crypto space with regard to transfer, transparency or lack thereof and VC, you know, I guess, manipulation of tokens to capitalize and then leave. So it's great to hear that the whole, all parties involved in what you're building are, are longitudinally focused, building out something of quality. Is there anything that you wanted to mention with regard to your future goals or your, your, your vision of of everything as you build towards mainnet and as you start to really showcase a, a, a real application for DeFi, what's yeah. something that's you know you want to send a message to the, the community? Sure, and I think you know, firstly, like we really want this to be a community effort. So, like, get involved, download Vega uh, when it becomes available as a public testnet. Get engaged with us on Twitter. Our forums at community.vega.xyz as well. We're going to start running more and more sort of competitions, getting more info out there. If you have questions, you know, particularly around how things work or you know, interested in and how to build for Vega, then you know, let us know and reach out. We want to do all of this stuff kind of more and more in the open. So you know, over time, we'll become more and more focused on making decisions and doing things in a way that the community can see and get involved with, because uh, I think that's really, really important. And I think you know, in, in the long term, what we really want to do is give ourselves the best chance of having a huge impact. And so uh, not only are we focused on kind of launching this year, but we're also focused on how do we go from a kind of a relatively low key alpha launch where we, we iron out the kinks uh, and then how do we spend 2021 you know, after the Q4 launch, how do we spend 2021 sort of finding the product market fit and the hockey stick growth and making sure that we're well positioned in terms of funding, well positioned in terms of our strategy, in terms of our relationships, in terms of the market makers and people already on the platform, the, the stability of the code itself and everything, you know, to really grab the initiative that we create by launching that, that public mainnet in, in Q4 and turn that into a really, really amazing success story in terms of growth of trading volume, in terms of people actually using Vega and in terms of demonstrating some of those things we talked about. Mm, well, Barney, I, I really no one could have said it better. Clearly, you're setting yourself up, self up for arguably serious success with your team, giving yourself yet another year or half a year to get towards that main net. Everything you've said is really suggesting a confluence of all those variables to provide for a, a leading a DeFi reviews platform and protocol for the future. Already, it's a hot topic right now. A lot of people are wanting something like this. It's going to be great to see you enter into this uh, sort of this crypto game, as they call it. But mate, if anyone wants to get in touch with you or wants to go and engage more with the community, well, which social media sort of um, means is, are there available for people to get involved? I'll put them all in the links below as well so that people can. But you want to just give a bit of a plug to your social media yeah, absolutely. So we have we have community forums at community.vega.xyz. 
Uh, we have a Twitter account which is actively monitored and, and, and you know, sort of active at, at, at Vega Protocol. Uh, I have a personal Twitter which is at Barnaby, which is B A R N A B and double E. Um, it's a sort of strange spelling of my name. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's uh, those are the main main ways. Got it. Well, I'll put them all in the description below. And Barney, as a founder, as one of the key members of, of this project, of this protocol, of this team, thank you so much for making time today. Uh, for all those listening, it was entirely free. It's all about education on the blockchain, looking at what is leading in the space. And DeFi absolutely is the buzzword right now. And looking at derivatives, all these suggestions are that volume is there. And we certainly need more discussion about what's available in a trustless, permissionless framework or offering. This, this team, this Vega protocol is really at the cutting edge of this discussion and we're yet to see exactly what's gonna come forth at mainnet, but it is exciting times. Wish you all the very best, Barney, as you build this with your team and hopefully we can catch up, mate, before mainnet and really just continue to discuss how you're developing so that people can become aware and get ready for what, what is Vega protocol. Awesome, thanks, Brad. And I'm really, really excited to continue the conversation with you, but also, you know, with all your sort of subscribers and with everyone else in the community, like we really do want to make this a very open and collaborative process and I'm very happy to sort of take questions, feedback and, and all, of, all of that uh, via their social channels, so thank you. Absolutely, mate, you're very welcome. And for hopefully others who can to our content creators, hopefully they can get, in, get, on, get on a call with you as well, Barney, engage in more of that discussion, spread the word of your value and really allow for people to understand more in the crypto community and beyond of what is coming for derivatives, for DeFi derivatives on the blockchain. Take care, mate, and hopefully we can catch up again soon. Thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Thanks, Brad.